Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee and uh, particularly Professor uh, Kostas Papanikolas for inviting me to give this talk uh, in this uh, very exciting conference for me. Um, the title, uh, as you notice, is uh, Heterogeneous Catalysis for Solar Fuels. And um, if you want to talk about uh, catalysis, uh, what role plays, uh, plays uh, in this uh, subject of uh, producing uh, fuels uh, using solar energy, I think we have to understand that uh, there are two players in this uh, uh, business. One, of course, is the solar technology, but on the other hand is the catalyst. So I saw that in this conference, uh, there is so much uh, information on the solar technology, but nothing actually on the catalysis part. So I think it's a good opportunity for the audience to hear some basics about, uh, uh, about the production of uh, fuels using catalysts uh, uh, and of course, uh, solar technology. I would like to uh, notice to you to share with you the importance of catalysis, the industrial catalysis for the energy sector and the economy. Then I would like to uh, show to those of you in this audience that uh, they don't really know uh, basics uh, about uh, how, catalyst, how a catalyst works. And I will give you a very short example. Just uh, I prepare a video just for one minute. Then I would like to uh, present to you uh, how heterogeneous catalysis um, uh, helps uh, the, uh, the uh, solar concentrated power uh, technology to produce um, uh, fuels and chemicals. And uh, in particular, due to time restrictions, I would like to show you just one example. The uh, successful, I would like to say, uh, uh, demonstration, at least at the moment, of producing hydrogen and zinc gas uh, using uh, catalytic uh, uh, solar technology. And some conclusions at the end. To appreciate uh, the importance and the key role of catalysis as a field and as a technology, I would like to share with you a very recent strategic paper um, prepared by the European Cluster uh, on Catalysis uh, for the European uh, Committee about the future of European catalysis research and development. These people, they say, first, catalysis and catalytic processes account directly or indirectly for 20 to 30 percent of world's gross domestic product. Second, catalyst manufacturing in Europe has a large economic impact, equal to 3 to 4 billion euros per year. Third, global market of, of, of catalysts 2017 was about 15 billion euro, chemical sharing 70%, 75% of that, and the rest goes to petroleum refining. Of the 50 largest volume chemicals currently produced, 30 are produced via catalytic routes. Most of others are, su are subsequently used in catalytic processes. These 50 highest volume chemical processes account for 20 billion tons of CO2 emissions per year. The manufacture of 18 of those products among thousands accounts for 80% of the energy demand and 75% of greenhouse gases emissions in the whole chemical industry. Also, technical improvements in catalyst catalytic processes could reduce energy intensity for these products by 20 to 40% by 2050. So the, really, those are very, very important statements. And these people, they uh, also state that this is a reality, this is a fact, that catalysis represents a key technology for the European economy. Catalysis opens new routes to sustainable and environmentally green processes and products, green and sustainable future economy. 
and European, European industrial, industrial leadership, leadership in manufacturing, manufacturing is critically dependent on the innovation capability in catalysis and chemistry. Catalysis has a key critical role in shaping the future of chemical and energy production vectors. And what are the challenges? And I'm very happy to see that, and is related to our conference, redesign chemical processes to minimize the use of fossil fuels directly using renewable energy sources, solar or wind fuels chemicals. And this is all about this conference and talk. There's a need for new types of catalytic materials for efficient solar light harvesting. So those are remarks from experts in the field, and I would like to uh, share, share with, with you. you. Now, now uh, catalysis, catalysis is not, not anymore a state. Uh, I mean, uh, a state, state of the art. The I mean, you have, you have to, to you have, have to understand, understand at the atomic, atomic scale, scale fundamentally, fundamentally every single step from reactants to make your products. products. So, so new innovations in catalytic materials for energy and chemicals must really follow this path. Most of the industrial catalysts today uh, consist of uh, supported metal or metal oxide phases, or both. So we're talking about multi-phase catalytic systems. And as an example, you can see from this slide, we're talking really about um, from nanoparticles, even clusters of the order of uh, uh, 10 angstrom, one nanometer, up to 50, 100 nanometers. And uh, the beauty of this uh, catalytic chemistry is that uh, the rate of reaction, the catalytic rate of reaction, is a function of the structure and the details of, this, uh, of the surface of such solid materials. So in order to develop a very good and selective and stable catalyst, you have to really understand this relation between the structure, the surface structure of your material and <laughs> The rate, the rate of reaction, of reaction. How, how what what, what is what this kind of relationship? relationship. And of course, uh, thanks to uh, electron spectroscopy uh, today, we can have a very nice pictures how this uh, catalyst, the structure of this catalyst look like. You can even see the spacing in the crystal structures of these materials. To demonstrate to you um, this principle that uh, we need to understand on a fundamental basis on an atomic level what catalyst is doing, I would like to show you just for one minute this uh, video. Initially, ethene molecules are absorbed on the surface of nickel. Adsorption increases the concentration of ethene on the surface of a catalyst which helps in increasing the rate of the reaction. During adsorption, the double bond between carbon atoms breaks, and new bonds are formed between carbon and the surface of the catalyst. Simultaneously, hydrogen molecules also get adsorbed onto the surface of nickel. Here, they get broken down into hydrogen atoms. These hydrogen atoms can move over the surface of nickel. Of these hydrogen atoms, the one which diffuses close to the original ethene molecule breaks the old bond between carbon and nickel and a new bond between the carbon atom and hydrogen atom gets formed. The end of the original ethene where a new bond is formed now breaks free of the nickel surface and eventually the other end also breaks free. Thus, the product ethane is now entirely free. And this leaves space on the surface of nickel to adsorb more ethene and hydrogen. So, uh, I hope that uh, this uh, gave us, uh, gave you some uh, good feedback about uh, what, the catal what Catalyst is doing. 
And this, of course, uh, the a simple uh, case. Uh, I have a problem here. Can I go back to slide? Okay. Okay. I'm here. Yeah. Um, okay. Then, uh, of course, uh, um, there's no need to say to you what is a fuel, what is a solar fuel, but just to make sure that everybody understands uh, what we're talking about. A fuel can be defined as any chemical compound that stores energy which can be released after reacting with oxygen to provide heat. So we're talking about chemical to thermal transformation. And of course, in the case of fuel cells, we're talking about the direct production of electricity, so chemical to electrical energy. Now, a solar fuel is any chemical compound that can react with oxygen to release energy, which has first been formed in part or in full by input of energy from solar radiation. Of much interest is the concentrated solar radiation uh, to store solar energy in a chemical form as a fuel via high temperature thermochemical reactions. Now, um, to come to the uh, uh, case of uh, solar fuels, this is something that was uh, was pre presented in the first talk uh, uh, this afternoon, and I, will, I don't like to repeat it. Just I would like to focus on the steam methane reforming reaction technology that is used, of course, in the non-solar thermal uh, uh, technology that uh, people are trying to develop. So uh, today, hydrogen or syngas, mixture of CO and hydrogen, is produced largely from the reforming of uh, methane by steam following this reaction. But, and of course, if you want to produce pure hydrogen, you have to follow again, you have to follow uh, after the water gasship reaction, which is this, the reaction of CO with water. So you make CO2 and hydrogen, and overall you make uh, hydrogen and CO2, and you separate the CO2 from hydrogen, CO2 mixture, and you have hyd pure hydrogen. Now, uh, there's another route to reform methane, natural gas, by reacting it with CO2. And now you see the difference. The difference uh, is not in the temperature range or in the catalyst, but in the ratio of hydrogen to CO that is formed. Here we're talking about one, here we're talking about three. And what is the important uh, issue about the ratio is that uh, it's more convenient if, you, if somebody wants to follow fischer tropsch reaction in order to make fuels. So um, now, if you talk about solar hydrogen fuel, then of course, somebody can tell you about hydrogen economy. I put question mark because really this is a big discussion whether we are close or far away still from hydrogen economy. We have to realize, of course, that if we have to go to hydrogen economy, then you have to supply huge quantities of energy for the industry and, of course, for the chemical industry. And there are still issues not solved about transportation, storage, and competitive costs compared to other alternatives. So before we go to this transition, I think a lot of people agree that we have to go step by step. So one uh, good way is to uh, utilize um, um, carbon uh, uh, fuels, carbon-containing fuels, fossil fuels, using solar energy and go to syngas and then go to liquid fuels because we have all the infrastructure. Um, this technology has been demonstrated um, through uh, companies like Sasol, Shell, uh, uh, and uh, today we have a very huge industrial uh, unit in Qatar, which produces from natural gas through catalytic technology, synthetic fuels, diesel, gasoline. You can see here the advantage of uh, GTL, gas to liquid fuel, as far as environmental issues, less tar, less uh, uh, smoke, <laughs> uh, and uh, 
about the same uh, performance as far as energy power compared to the uh, uh, ordinary uh, diesel that uh, is produced from crude oil. Now, the other route to go is to the dry reforming by utilizing uh, CO2. The question is where to find the CO2. There are big, big huge uh, reserves in, uh, uh, in natural gas where they are rich in CO2, more than 40%, and those cannot be utilized as a fuel, as you know, as you realize. So the only way to utilize them is to treat them chemically, if you can, to get the energy out from methane. So this is the dry reforming of methane, of course, as I told you before. So one source to produce syngas and hydrogen is from dry reforming using this kind of source. The other source is, of course, the biogas. And there's a third uh, thought about uh, doing dry reforming, catalytic dry reforming. And this is if you can capture huge quantities of CO2 release, and this is the case from power plants, for example, to uh, mix them with the natural gas, do dry reforming, so you produce syngas and then fuels through fissure troughs. This is the interesting uh, uh, reaction that we're doing in our, in our uh, laboratory and, of course, uh, in many other laboratories worldwide, dry reforming of methane, and the problem is the coking. There is a problem uh, of uh, uh, de depositing uh, carbon uh, kind of structures. You can see here in this picture a carbon whisker. It can be, it can be graphite, amorphous carbon. So the catalyst deactivates not in a time that uh, industry can afford. And so there is a big effort to develop carbon resistant supported nickel because of the cost base catalyst for dry reforming. Uh, solar dry reforming, I need just three minutes. Uh, dry reforming now, as far as solar, uh, there's a lot of work done by this group in Weizmann for several years now, and it, it is considered one of the best technologies available today from my understanding. And I can only uh, I can only say to you the use of a coated ruthenium catalyst. Uh, so this technology is for the is for other experts. It's not for me uh, to tell you something about this. But I would like to tell you that these people here develop their own catalyst. It's not a commercial catalyst, but it's a it's a catalyst that was tested by Weizmann uh, Institute. Of course, there are some others that I list here. And the interesting thing that uh, one can see from some reviews is the fact that there is a hope that this solar reforming technology, at some point, depending on the price of the, of the natural gas, could really beat the uh, ordinary uh, uh, steam re reforming uh, based uh, on today's uh, technology. So that's, uh, I think, a good message, a very, a very uh, good message uh, for this uh, uh, conference that um, uh, we have uh, good hope to apply catalysis for producing uh, seeing gas and hydrogen through steam reforming. Uh, here I would like to just inform you, uh, taking into uh, account the fact that I was invited in this conference to let you know that with Cyprus Institute, uh, we recently had um, a successful infrastructure project, uh, project uh, from national funds, which relates to dry reforming of methane. This is the, uh, the proposal we have made. And uh, the idea here that comes from the Cyprus Institute, uh, from George, Dr. Biscos, is to try to use spark and arc ablation for nanoparticle synthesis and use those uh, uh, on a given carrier that we will develop in our laboratory to prepare supported catalysts, but with a very, very um, uniform particle size. Why the interest to this 
type of catalyst because it's, well, it's very well known in catalysis field that the size of the of the of your catalyst of your uh, catalytic particle depends a lot uh, the, i mean sorry the rate depends a lot on the particle size so today we don't know we don't have really any good relationships between particle size of a catalytic phase and turnover frequency or a catalytic rate and finally i would like to draw some conclusions for you about solar reforming at present solar steam reforming was proved to be feasible by solar parabolic dishes and towers and various reactor configurations solar parabolic troughs as as mature technology and are and much cheaper cannot reach yet temperatures above 700 let's say 50 which is required for reforming reactions but future development of cheaper um, concentrated solar power systems along with suitable catalytic reactor reactor configurations catalyst and reactor design to run reforming at lower temperatures and this is the challenge uh, i think uh, it's uh, it's the message probably i can uh, send to you uh, given this talk and of course i would like to thank you for your attention and patience Time for only one question. Are there any questions? No. Thank you for your uh, presentation. I I only wanted to add a comment uh, and maybe also have question regarding this uh, final comment on the dry. Dry reform. reforming because I think it's uh, I fully agree that this uh, old uh, you know in the 80s there were many activities from Weizmann from Sandia National Labs yes not only with nickel rhodium catalysts yes uh, they, but at that time the mobilizer was the thermochemical pipes I remember that Michael Epstein all the groups yes. they were interested in using the reverse reaction so but I think uh, do you think uh, it might be uh, Nice opportunities combining this production of carbon and uh, the fuel uh, with this dry uh, reforming because uh, I think it opens uh, a lot of opportunities for 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 business. Uh, yes, you know the dry reforming is uh, well um, worked out uh, today. It's not something that uh, we don't know. I mean, we need to uh, develop further knowledge. But uh, the dry reforming I'm referred to in just single dry reforming, not mixing it with uh, uh, steam or uh, oxygen to do partial oxidation, for example, to produce syngas. So you have ready the feedstock, all right? As I told you, biogas, no, no more any other feedstock. Um, natural gas rich in CO2. Capture huge quantities of CO2 if, you, if we can and mix them with natural gas. So those are much more simpler configurations. Okay, as far as reactor designs, you know, all these technologies. So just a follow up comment. Uh, capturing CO2, yes, get paid for that. You'll get paid uh, if you sequester and capture it, especially out of power plants. Uh, has anybody put the economics together? Because this will lower the cost. You know, many ideas are there, but uh, no, no, of course there are. are of course there are. The idea, I'm sure. Is there a study to show because your price yes. assumed does not uh, that considers as a cost? If it was economical uh, today, it would you we would see it in the market or at least in a more uh, progressive uh, manner. Um, but uh, the ideas are there, there are people that are working towards to find uh, suitable solutions and of course the economics uh, at the end is what it matters. Uh, I, don't, I don't know uh, figures to give you now as far as um, competitiveness, uh, as far as uh, cost competitiveness uh, of this CO2 capture, uh, but uh, it's an idea that uh, many people are working uh, to find uh, economical economical solution for sure.